first item of business today is a member's business debate on motion 5106 in the name of Liam Kerr on cycle capacity on Scotland railways. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put and may I ask those members who wish to speak to press the request to speak buttons. I call on Liam Kerr to open the debate around seven minutes please. Thank you Deputy Presiding Officer and I thank all of those from across the chamber who added their support to the motion, allowing us to debate what is on so many levels and to so many different groups a very important issue. There are two things that I particularly enjoy, cycling and trains, and preferably together. Living in the North East allows me to indulge both. I frequently will cycle along the old D-side line out past Bankery, down over the Cairn Mount to Montrose, where I'll pick up the train back to Aberdeen. I and often four or five companions will stop and spend locally, perhaps at the Milton, the Crathis, the Clattering Brig or Feta Cairn, which provides a no doubt welcome economic boost in the current climate. Now, according to Sustrans, cycle tourism like that is worth £345 million a year to the Scottish economy. But it's not just tourism. The Scottish Government has an ambition for 10% of journeys to be made by bike by 2020, which requires commuting. Now, bike parking at stations has improved tremendously. However, many commuters not only want to cycle to the station, but to get on their own bike at the other end. Now, nearly all ScotRail trains between Edinburgh, Glasgow and Inverness, Aberdeen are three-car Class 170 turbo stars. Officially, these have four bike spaces on board, two spaces in each of two carriages. So, if I get to Montrose, with three friends in tow, but there's a bike already on the train, one of us is stuck. However, from summer 2018, ScotRail will start introducing 26 refurbished Class 43 sets. If you picture an intercity 125, like the Virgin East Coast use, that's what we're talking about. They're 40 years old, but they're still the fastest diesels in the world, and they will serve Scotland's seven cities. They look fantastic. They will deliver a 33% capacity increase, a reduction in journey times, and a much more comfortable passenger experience. All this with completely revamped Mark III coaches delivering what passengers told ScotRail they wanted. And what's more, in February 2015, on the penultimate slide of a presentation to the cross-party group on cycling, the ScotRail franchise delivery team stated, the class 125s will have a capacity of at least 20 cycles. However, it was discovered by Spokes, the Lothian-based cycle campaigners currently celebrating their 40th anniversary, that ScotRail have scaled back. The new plan is for eight bike spaces per train, two in a vertical hanging rack in one of the coaches, and three in each of the two power car luggage compartments. And furthermore, these latter six spaces will only be available for end-to-end -end journeys, such as Aberdeen to Edinburgh and will not be accessible at intermediate stations due to the inevitable delays of getting a push bike on and off at the end of the train. So if I want to go from, for example, Edinburgh to Inverness, some services require a change at Perth, so the six wouldn't even be available to me. So for my trip from Montrose, going forward, I actually take a chance on one of the two spaces on the coach, half the current provision. And I'm grateful to a transport expert who I've been corresponding with who made me aware of possible health and safety and loading concerns with those two. Now, will ScotRail review the situation? Well, I believe so, uh, hence this motion and hence the debate. I also wrote to ScotRail in April highlighting this issue and asked for a meeting, which duly took place on the 9th of May, and we covered a lot of very useful ground. Because there are solutions, and no doubt colleagues from around the chamber will suggest their own. For my part, I do appreciate that there could be timetable delays from loading and offloading bikes at intermediate stations, but any basic logistics adjustment ought to ameliorate this. Allocating cycle reservations to a specific power car and putting the rider's seats in the adjacent coach, for example. Platform markings to show where the cyclist needs to wait to load. Station staff actively working with the cyclist or the guard of the cycle passenger. Or an online system showing available reservable bike spaces and the location on the train, just like Great Western, who of course are running the current ScotRail sets right now, do already. And it's always difficult to directly read across, but I understand that French trains open their luggage door at every station. 
And I do appreciate it may be logistically challenging to do this at every station, but at the very least, surely consideration should be given to opening at the key hub stations, such as Perth, Inverness, Dundee, Stirling. The Virgin Class 43s to Inverness seem to cope with bikes in Coach A. And since bikes have to be pre-booked, the guard knows in advance when the door needs to be unlocked. Or maybe we relook at general capacity. Dave Holliday, a recognised transport expert, suggests having two bikes per carriage, plus four or five in each of the two power cars. Questions have also been raised around space in the redundant toilets, i.e. those unused in the new design, which will simply be locked up, spokes terms transporting air. An earlier upgrading of the Mark III coaches by Chiltern completely removed the toilet and luggage rack to create a, a kind of large vestibule. This creates flexible bike space, but also extra for buggies, push chairs, and passenger surge at stations. And of course, since the refurbishment work to fit the sliding doors will involve removing the toilets and luggage racks at the coach ends to install the door pockets, would it really be so difficult? Finally, a quick point, as I, I want to give the Minister plenty of opportunity to clear up what I think is a, a genuine misunderstanding. I tried to draft the motion very carefully because I didn't want to politicise this debate, but despite being out for nearly two months, as at today's date, not one SNP member has signed. I'm genuinely surprised at this and a bit disappointed because I think on issues like this we need to put the politics aside. Um, we need to work constructively with ScotRail to find solutions, particularly given the cycling targets we talked of earlier. Uh, the Minister will know that that absence has been noted by those outside this chamber and I, I just thought it fair to give the Minister an opportunity in closing to explain that omission if he would. Deputy Presiding Officer, the Scottish Government is desperate for a modal shift to cycling by 2020, but appears to be missing the target at the moment. ScotRail can play a major part in making cycle tourism easy, but also encouraging cycle commuting. With the new rolling stock coming in, there is a fantastic opportunity to do it. And I look forward to continuing the dialogue with ScotRail with a view to a solution. Thank you. We move to the open debate. Speeches of four minutes, please. Up to four minutes. I call Marie Todd to be followed by Graeme Simpson. <laughs> thank you, Presiding Officer. And thank you, Liam Kerr, for bringing forward this member's debate. Um, apologies for not signing your motion. Um, I have to claim that that was an oversight, not politics at all on my part. Scotland is, of course, a um, fantastic destination for cycle tourism and in the Highlands and Islands the region that I represent we boast some of the most scenic cy cycle routes in the whole country. Cycle tourism brings huge benefits and value to the Scottish economy. According to Sustrans it's worth 345 million a year. This is particularly great for the rural economy because we know that cyclists will stop and spend money um, locally injecting money into local businesses. Cycle tourism brings significant environmental benefits compared to many other types of tourism and that's mainly because cyclists tend to use public transport when they're reaching the start of their tour and for making onward connections instead of using their own car. The picture in Scotland is a bit mixed in terms of um, bike rail integration. On the positive side bikes are allowed on most trains um, free of charge and can be booked in advance. On the other hand, the number of bikes allowed on a train is typically pretty limited. Um, at the moment, usually only four, and it often requires mandatory prior booking. So these factors provide a significant discouragement to allowing larger groups to travel together and reduce flexibility in travel pal planning, for example, if there's bad weather or mechanical failure or illness. For example, I heard from a group of four people who travelled from Switzerland to go on a cycling tour in Scotland. They had a really tight schedule and a week-long plan. And not being able to get a train would have thrown out their whole programme because they had to book in advance. And if another book group had been trying to get on the same train, someone would be left behind. So they mentioned that getting the bikes on and off the trains was hard and pressure due to timing, as you've mentioned. Looking at the situation now, I'm pleased that ScotRail are going to be phasing in new high-speed trains into service in 2018 on the routes that serve Scotland's seven cities. These new trains will provide extra capacity. But it is disappointing to learn that rather than an expected rise in cycle capacity, these new trains seem to offer a reduction in what's already provided. And I hope that the Minister will clarify whether this is indeed the case when he sums up. 
So as I understand it, there'll be eight bike spaces, two vertical uh, hanging rack in one of the coaches and three in each of the two power car lu luggage compartments. But I, I hear that six of those spaces will only be available for, as Liam said, uh, as Liam Kerr said, end-to-end -end journeys. So if you were to try and to get on in an intermediate station, and this is what I would really like you to clarify. So, for example, if you get on in Aviemore, in the, which is in the Cairngorm National Park, top cycling destination, the two bike spaces are already taken, you wouldn't be able to get on a train. So given the social and economic benefits of cycle tourism in Scotland, this really misses an opportunity. Also, as a member of the Health and Sport Committee, I fully support integrating cycle, uh, cycling and transport as a way to make cycle tourism and cycling commuting easy and to encourage people to get fit and active. So what solutions can be offered? In Switzerland, on popular routes with tourists and cyclists, there's an additional freight-style carriage at the back of the, the train for people to put their bikes on. It doesn't clog up the passageways or disabled spaces or risk bikes falling down or hurting someone. On other trains, there are carriages with less seats that are specially for people with bikes, as well as push chairs and other bulky equipment that keeps them t all together rather than spread out through the train. The other solution is maybe more ceiling hooks that you put the front wheel of a bike um, on, onto and hang them vertically so that they take up less space. Could there be more of these on the train? I know that the key constraint is that the, in the UK space is limited because the train gauge is small due to the 19th century tunnels. Hanging options might not be feasible, but accommodating the requirement of cyclists is no trivial task. And it's you a really must close, please, Mr. Worthy Todd. endeavour when we consider the benefits that cycling and cycling tourism brings. Call Graham Simpson to be followed by Claudia Beamish. Can I thank uh, Liam Kerr for bringing this debate uh, to Parliament today? It's a shame we're here, given that Abellio originally vowed to help Scotland go Dutch and to create a Scottish cycle revolution. They took on the ScotRail franchise with big promises and a grand vision. And those of us who enjoy cycling got quite excited. Sadly, progress has not been what we hoped for. Maybe it will get better. Let's look at Abellio's bold vision. In their cycle innovation plan, they say they will bring innovation to the relationship between the cycle and the railway, firstly, by increasing the priority given to cycles at stations and train, secondly, through the products and services that we can offer to cycle users, and thirdly, through the way that we communicate with our customers on cycling issues. It all sounds great, doesn't it? But as Liam Kerr's motion, which came on the back of a cycling Twitter storm, shows, the reality has been far different. Far from increasing capacity for bikes on trains, they're cutting it on key routes. The CIP actually gives the game away and perhaps explains what they mean by going Dutch. It says, quotes, our overall long-term strategy in the Netherlands has been to reduce the pressure on cycle spaces on board trains by investing in better storage facilities at stations and encouraging regular cyclists to either join our bike and go scheme for their onward journeys or maintain a second bike at their destination stations. We intend to replicate this successful approach on ScotRail. Deputy Presiding Officer, we have an admirable but unrealistic target of having 10% of journeys done by bike in Scotland by 2020. That's less than three years away. But at the current rate of progress, it will take us 300 years. 300 years. Abellio can be part of the progress we need, but they need to do better. On the 25th of February 2015, the ScotRail franchise delivery team told a meeting at the Scottish Parliament that there would be improvements in 2018-19 with the introduction of four and five coach into city trains and an expectation that these would carry at least 20 cycles. Spokes have since discovered that the increase in bike space on trains has been gradually but significantly reduced. On the Edinburgh stroke Glasgow to Inverness and East Coast main lines, there'll be fewer spaces for bikes than at present. Abellio also proposed to cut bookable spaces from six to two on West Highland tourist routes. Now, Transport Scotland has the power 
to specify that current bike capacity should be maintained, as it has to approve all new train configurations. In Europe, it's common for each carriage to have to have a flexible space in every carriage, allowing more people to not only travel with bikes, but also prams and bulky luggage. This would allow more standing space in peak service trains. There is a mood in this chamber to boost sustainable transport, and that's why we have the cross-party group on cycling, walking, and buses, on which I'm deputy convener. But there are those who just don't get it. Last week, for example, there was a crazy proposal to scrap South Lanarkshire's cycle partnership. Thankfully, that was knocked on the head. We've seen cycle routes ripped up in some parts of the country after pressure from the anti-bike brigade. Councils and government need to stand up to these people. Getting people on their bikes helps health, physical and mental. It helps productivity. It saves the public purse. It matters. I don't think Abellio are in the negative column for cycling, but they need to go the extra mile to do better. I call Claudia Beamish to be followed by Alison Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I want to thank Liam Kerr for bringing this debate to the Chamber. As a co-convener like um, my colleague on the opposite benches, uh, Graham, to, to the new cross-party group for cycling, walking and buses, and as a co-convener of the CPG for Cycling in the previous session, um, along with Alison Johnson, I'm passionate about the development of cycling opportunities, active travel and also integrated public transport. This morning, in the female changing facilities, I was discussing today's debate with cycle commuters. One said she used to travel from Aberdeen to Edinburgh regularly for work by train, using her bike at each end of the journey. Another told me she regularly took her car to the park and ride and then cycled. Another highlighted the joy of taking bikes on the train to Gurk and then the ferry to Danoon for the start of a cycling holiday. Whether it's for work, leisure or a holiday, nobody should have to experience the stress of worrying about whether they can get their bike on a train. Research, as we heard from Liam Kerr by Sustrand, says that 345 million um, is added by cycling tourism to the Scottish economy every year. And as Transform Scotland research has shown, further development of the National Cycle Network and other cycle routes across the country would increase the figure substantially. The capacity for bikes on trains is fundamental to this. In my own region, we have Borders Rail, which over the last 18 months has proved successful in encouraging tourists into the borders. Cycle tourism is a significant contributor to the local economy. It is a popular cycle, cycling destination with many bike trails and cycling paths to enjoy. However, access to the area is made difficult for cycling tourism when there is not adequate bicycle storage on trains. I've taken a keen interest in this issue for some time, and I'm getting a strong sense of déjà vu at the moment. In September 2013, I asked the then Transport Minister, Keith Brown, I quote, what provisions for cycling access and storage on trains and at stations will be included in the contract for rail passenger services to be issued in 2014? I suggested looking at solutions, as did Marie Todd, used on the continent, such as cycling, uh, cycle carriages to improve trains for cyclists. These could be used in the tourist season and even relocated for specific road cycling events. The minister replied, the next ScotRail franchise will commence in 2015 in April. Bidders will be required to develop plans to improve rail's integration with the wider, tra with the wider transport system, which of course includes improvements for facilities for cyclists. I had thought of stating today that we must be sure that the next franchise tender sets even more robust and imaginative uh, demands for bikes on trains in its criteria, but then I stopped myself. That's because it's years ahead, even though it is an imperative. And as stated in Liam Kerr's motion today, on the 25th of February 2015, we heard that the franchise delivery team informed a meeting in the parliament which I was attending that the we heard about the introduction of more, um, uh, more bikes on rail. And now we hear that each train will only carry eight bicycles and that the interim journeys are even more, interim stops are even more problematic. Spokes Lothian has stated quite clearly 
that converting some of the redundant toilets into bike spaces is a possibility. And Liam Kerr made many positive suggestions, as have other members, as to a way forward. And Spokes Lothian suggests that this problem could surely be resolved, I quote, with a, short, with a small cash injection from Transport Scotland. And I give the example that way back in 1998, this was managed by the Scottish administration, which was then in government and arranged through match funding. Surely the present government could do something similar. I strongly agree with the motion and support it. We need action now. Thank you. I call Alison Johnson to be followed by Brian Whittle. Um, thank you, presiding officer. I too thank Liam Kerr for the opportunity to debate this subject. And I thank my fellow co-conveners of the Cross-Party Group on Cycling in Session 4, Claudia Beamish and Jim Eady, and look forward to working with Claudia Beamish once more and Graeme Simpson and other members in this session. Um, I'm also endlessly thankful to Spokes, the Lothian Cycle Campaign Group, for their tireless work on this and many other cycling-related issues. And I welcome their representatives, Ewan Jeffrey and Jolyn Warren, to the Chamber today. Like me, no doubt, constituents are contacting you frequently with concerns over active travel infrastructure, both nationally and locally. Following this debate, I'm meeting constituents who are presenting a petition in Parliament probably at this very moment to ensure that it is possible for cyclists and pedestrians to cross the Sheriff Hall roundabout in Dalkeith safely. So this issue of a joined up transport network that puts the needs of people at its heart is one that affects all of us and all modes of transport. It's one of the issues that I'm asked most to push the Scottish Government for improvements on. And this lack of facilities around taking bikes on trains, this, is, this comes up in my inbox day after day, time after time. And while better bike parking and cycle hire solutions are welcome, they're not the solution for many people. If you're on holiday up north, a family of four or five, and you're asking folk to hire bikes, this is an additional expense. And you know there are many people who are absolutely in love with their pride and joy, their custom made bicycle. That's the bike they want to tour around the highlands and islands on. We do seem to have some tension though. I mean, Network Rail took some persuading that the cyclists shouldn't be banned from Waverley Station. And when I took the opportunity to try out the Borders Railway, when it was newly opened with my bike, I tried booking a cycle space in advance to be sure, but I was told it was an unreservable service. Now, this first come, first served policy, it's an outdated way of approaching sustainable travel. And with leisure cycling and mountain biking being rapidly growing activities, and cycle tourism, as we've heard, contributing 345 million to the economy annually. I think the Scottish Government need to do more to embrace the opportunities to make this uh, an industry that Scotland is renowned for internationally and that we're able to accommodate demand for the length and breadth of the country. I don't think there's any good reason for provision to be so, so poor, so out of step with the experience that we have in other European countries. Um, I've travelled by train in Germany a lot, I'm just mentioning that, but, you know, there are many other good examples where multifunctional carriages are the norm. You know, there's space for 10 bikes, if they're not being used for bikes, then the seat folds down, people sit on them, you know, buggies can get on, no problem. There are better models in the 21st century. Um, spokes have highlighted the issue that perhaps we could use former loos that aren't going to be in use any longer. I'm not sure that's a comfortable solution, but... Transform Scotland make the point well too. In order to speed up journey times, we simply shouldn't be preventing cyclists boarding trains. That is not progress. So the Scottish Government do have a responsibility to include provision for active travel in all new major infrastructure proposals. Greens have consistently raised this during budget discussions each year. And with others like the Institute of Public Health Directors, we've called for 10% of the total transport budget to go towards active travel. And we will continue to press for such changes. To honour climate change commitments made in Paris and to bring our infrastructure into line with that of many of our European cousins, we have to take a different approach. Um, I, I'm not sure who it was that said that the vision of of 10% of all journeys by bike by 2020 was unrealistic. Well, it's only unrealistic because of the level of investment that we have at the moment. It's chronically underfunded. I do think the government has to ask far more of those that it awards franchises to. I mean, two bookable spaces is absolutely woeful in this day and age. Um, 
We are going backwards after being promised more. I think this is what's must making come people to close. so very, very angry. In closing, might I just ask the Minister to stop backpedalling on this issue? Thank you. I call Brian Whittle to be followed by Mark Ruskell. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I can also thank my colleague Liam Kerr for bringing this debate to the Chamber. Now, I would say I was, uh, at best, uh, an occasional cyclist. Uh, I am now and again seen um, battering down with my head down, backside up, flying around uh, the roads of East Kilbride uh, for an hour at a time, uh, maximum, I have to say. Um, but uh, my, uh, recently, my neighbour, who uh, has a, happens to have a boat down at, at Loch Lomond, invited me to cycle down to Loch Lomond uh, with him and uh, have some lunch there and get the train back. Now, I have to say that, 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 that it's a process about 30 miles and that prospect, I thought I can probably just about manage that. Yes, I might look like John Wayne uh, getting off a horse after a long day in the prairie, but, uh, uh, but I think I could just about manage that. Now, the thought of maybe having to cycle all the way back, there is no chance that I would have, I, I would have even have considered that. It's easy. Uh, good. Yeah, so you see these people here with all the gear, you know. See. Um, so I, I, my, I am I'm becoming more and more of a, a, a cyclist these days because as my youngest daughter, um, uh, reaches, she's now uh, nine, she's, uh, uh, she's got a, a bike now, and she's desperate to cycle to school, uh, of which I can't let her do that. Uh, it's probably about a mile, but the, 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 net, the road network on the way there would, uh, would certainly not be safe, shall we say, even if, I, even if I cycled with her. So what I'm actually having to do now is either uh, um, put, put bikes on roof racks, or get on the train, which I'm, we've done a few times, which is quite an adventure, I have to say, for a youngster. Get on the train, get, get, go to somewhere uh, uh, that's, that's sort of more conducive to, to, to cycling for youngsters, and then to spend some time cycling back on the train and come back again. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real adventure for It's an adventure for me as well, I have to say, uh, uh, to be able to do that. And it's a joy to be able to do that. I think that this, if we can go back to this idea of, of, of cycling to school, I think it's more of an... Um, I think the, her, her desire to, 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 to cycle to school and not being able to at the moment um, is kind of a, a, an endemic thing that's happening uh, uh, within the country. Uh, we're not really joining up particularly well. Um, my personal view is that uh, in terms of cycling, instead of building, uh, st starting off by building massive big uh, uh, cycle routes, I would really like to, to see uh, primary schools developed so that they could, uh, there's actually active travel. They have the, the ability to be active uh, uh, traveling to school, whether they want to walk or cycle or skateboard or scooter. Um, I, I, and I would like to see that as a, as a, a, a starting point. Um, I think that when I go back to my own day, I mean, I, I, uh, I did cycle to school or walk to school every day. And, and uh, I look at the, the, the bike sheds at my school were absolutely rammed full. And it was very difficult to actually find a space to put a bike in. And then I, I, I looked at my daughter's school the other day and there are six spaces uh, for bikes uh, at that school and I've yet to see a bike in those spaces. Uh, now and again there's the odd scooter uh, but they're, they're not getting the opportunity to cycle to school. And I think that's where we need to, be. for me that's where we need to be and I think the cycle berths on trains are kind of an end result uh, of a policy that we could implement much earlier in, in life. This idea that if we can create an environment where because uh, kids actually do want to do this. They, they, there's about th three or four children in my street who would cycle to school uh, if they had the opportunity. Um, and and they should, we just don't have that, uh, that environment in the moment where they could do that. And, and I think if we can start looking ahead and trying to create an environment where active travel to school is a viable option as a first step, uh, and perhaps we will debate this topic again sometime in the future when we'll be calling for even more capacity for bikes and trains as cyclists queue up uh, to board, board the station. So I think we need to think about this as an end-to-end -end, uh, debate, an end-to-end -end issue, and, and try and treat it as such. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Whittle. I wonder if next time you'd maybe address the motion. <laughs> OK. And we, we move to the last contribution in the open debate, and it's Mark Ruskell. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. And can I thank Liam Kerr for bringing forward this motion? Um, it's not often that we get to debate cycling in this chamber, so it's very welcome. And it's not often that we get to debate how cycling integrates with other transport modes. So I think a, a really good topic for, for debate and very timely. Um, I will declare an interest, Presiding Officer, in that I've spent probably most of my working life um, traveling to my place of work, either by bike 
or taking my bike to station, parking it and getting on a train, or taking my bike to station, putting it on the train, getting off the other end and cycling. Um, and I've enjoyed it. It's been, it's been good. It's been good for my, for my mental health as well as my physical health. Um, but I would say that the current, uh, the current provision that we have on trains, particularly in central Scotland with the class 170s, is quite bizarre. Um, because most trains around Europe, and in fact around the rest of the UK as well, have a, when you bring your bike onto the train, it actually has a vertical hook where you can hook your bike up. As a result of that, it's very easy to get on and off the train and you can carry many more bikes. The current class 170s have a kind of horizontal rack, which means that you have to uh, choreograph uh, the, the, you're, you're stacking your, your bike on there with loads of other people who are also trying to get onto the train and other cyclists. Uh, and it makes it very complicated because it means that you have to have a discussion every morning with the four or five or six other cyclists who are also trying to put their bike on the train at the same time. It's a great way to meet people. Um, you know, I've met lots of people who had great discussions on, on the back of it, but it is an absolute hassle. Um, I have to say that the guards are, are very helpful. Uh, there are only two places that are available in every um, two-car set. Um, but most regular cycle commuters know how to stack their bikes creatively so that they can get at least four bikes into the two-place um, uh, parking area. So, uh, you know, I, I, I think we need to make some progress on this. And I recognize that the focus uh, from Scott Rail Bellio so far has been around bike parking. It's about ensuring there's adequate facilities uh, at many of our major stations. And I think we're starting to see some great improvements there. And I would, you know commend the, the bike and go bike hire scheme, which I think is working well, you know, alongside other initiatives like Nextbike. But that doesn't suit everybody, and it certainly doesn't suit people who want to join up their journeys uh, and take their bikes with them. And I think tourists are a particular case in point here. We've heard the figure from other members, about £345 million pounds coming into Scotland every year through cycle tourism. We're in danger of losing that. Um, so I'm considering taking my family up to Inverness, um, this summer for a, a mini tour, and we're probably going to take the Sustrans route down to Fort William. It's a great route. It's getting uh, a lot of coverage and is very popular. Um, but I have to say the hassle factor is really putting me off. And we could be getting to a point now where it may become more easier to stick your bike on a plane than it is to put your bike on a train. And obviously with APD cuts, uh, you know, that could have an impact on this 345 million pounds that's coming into Scotland. Um, solutions, uh, we've heard, I think, from many members in this debate, uh, about what the solutions are. Um, I think for the class 170s, looking at more creative use of the vestibule areas. I've noticed at peak times, not everybody wants to sit down. People just getting on for one or two stops, quite happy to stand. So actually having more flexible vestibule areas would allow more bikes to come on board the trains, but also create more space for luggage and mobility aids as well. And for the high-speed trains, I think we've heard, I think, a good, good set of solutions there that are coming forward from spokes, and I really hope the minister will, will reflect on those and put some pressure on ScotRail uh, to open it up so that uh, at least the Ruskell family can have a, an exciting holiday in the Highlands. And, yeah. um, so I think ultimately, though, um, we'll recognize that you know, bringing ScotRail back under uh, public hands again uh, would help so we can get access uh, before profit. Um, but I really hope that in the meantime that uh, the minister is able to put some pressure on ScotRail and we can get a, a resolution to this uh, particular issue. Thanks. I call Hamza Yousaf to respond to the debate. Um, around seven minutes, please, Minister. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'd like to thank uh, Liam Kerr for bringing this motion uh, to the Parliament. I want to thank him uh, in a couple of ways. First of all, for uh, the constructive tone, which he always seems to strike uh, in conversations, uh, which, uh, which I very much appreciate. Uh, for also engaging uh, with uh, Scott Rail, which I know uh, he has done in a constructive manner and in a constructive way, and also for his enthusiasm. When I first met Liam Kerr, uh, you know, he told me he was, uh, he was a real train buff and uh, he's done nothing to dispel uh, that since I've met him, uh, though I do regret having a picture of him uh, in Lycra in my briefing uh, that I looked at this morning before breakfast. Um, can I also thank Spokes, representatives of Spokes, are here as well. Um, and they, their ambition for cycling in Scotland is very well reflected by members across this chamber. Because although there will be disagreements, and that happens with campaign groups and lobby groups, and there are, of course, differences between you know, different political parties, it's very clear to me that everybody that has spoken today has been driven by their uh, ambition 
for cycling in Scotland. And that is a good, good thing. So can I welcome the debate very much and I'll try to address some of the points uh, that have been made. A disclaimer, if I may, I suppose at the, the offset which members have recognised that of course the day-to-day -day operation of train fleets, uh, how they manage passengers uh, on board, of course, does rest with ScotRail. They are currently finalising the layout and operational aspects of how on-train cycle storage will be managed to maximise the number it can carry when the 26th uh, refurbished HST's high-speed uh, trains do enter service on Scotland's intercity routes next summer. Uh, the reason why they're finalising that layout is because of conversations members, campaign groups like Spokes, many others have had with ScotRail uh, about some of the concerns about uh, on-train on cycle storage. Um, now, we are debating this issue because, as we, as we know, those HSTs will come into service next summer, 54 million being ploughed into them. They will, uh, of course, be of the latest standards of comfort uh, and accessibility, uh, which is, will be welcomed. And as Liam Kerr said, the passenger experience, uh, I think, will be very much uh, welcomed uh, as it will be improved. However, there is a recognition, I think, from, from those across the chamber, and some have reflected upon it, that spaces on trains, of course, are always limited. There needs to be a range of users, cyclists, of course, foot passengers, those with disabilities. I think that's obviously incredibly important. People with luggage, those with small children. Uh, but not that withstanding, we've heard from some members about innovative solutions where everybody can possibly be uh, accommodated. So as I said, the ScotRail are currently finalising the layout of the operational aspects and I would encourage them to listen very carefully to what members have said about the end-to-end -end destination and the issues with intermediate stops. I think that's been very, that point has been made uh, very strongly by, by Liam Kerr, by, by Graham Simpson, um, by, by other uh, speakers uh, as, uh, as well uh, across the chamber. So I would encourage them as they're having these discussions, as they're finalising the layout uh, of the operation, uh, that they take into account what has been said and look for an innovative solution. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, the, 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 the motion, um, obviously, is, uh, just to clarify the point that you asked me to clarify, as, as a member of the government, I didn't know, necessarily sign a motion, I'm sure he was understand. I think where there was some confusion was perhaps in the line where he says there will be fewer spaces for cycles uh, than at present. Can I just address that, that the HSB, HSTs, well as members have said, will have eight spaces, whereas currently we only have four with bookable spaces for two, so you know the fact by any uh, you know no creative accounting could, could could suggest that there's fewer spaces. There will be more spaces. However, the point I think Liam Kerr was trying to make, which is a valid one, that there might be fewer spaces on the intermediate stops. And, and I think again, as I can just reiterate, that is something that I would encourage ScotRail uh, to look at. So ScotRail will continue to to keep this policy uh, under review. It's committed to. Training, in, uh, training its staff in cycle capacity procedures, how to provide additional ad hoc spaces uh, where it can uh, as well. Uh, it should be said, uh, you know, people have mentioned the retention of the, the 170s uh, as well, which is great news, particularly good news for the Central Highlands, particularly good news for Murray, for Aberdeen, down the East Coast uh, as well. But I don't want to take away from what members uh, have said that always, Scotland should always look at where there can be innovative uh, or inventive solutions to cycle storage, and I think some of those uh, have been mentioned. Can I just touch upon the, the cycle integration point that's been made? I think a lot of members have characterised that there has to be a choice between either uh, the, the, the cycle solutions, uh, storage solutions at stations uh, versus on board uh, cycle storage. I think there doesn't have to be a tension between the two. I think uh, there should both should be looked at as ScotRail uh, are doing, and I'm very, very pleased uh, with the Scottish Government's and, and indeed ScotRail's investment uh, in this improving facilities. 194,000 from the Scottish, Scottish Stations Fund to significantly expand cycle parking facility at Haymarket with around 90 uh, spaces. 100,000 from the same fund to install 200 cycle spaces uh, at uh, Waverley as well. 5,000 cycle storage spaces at station across the rail network during the franchise. Uh, from those 1,269 uh, have been created at 44 locations already. And Bike and Go facilities, as mentioned by Mark Rusco, already opened actually at 11 stations, including Inverness, Aberdeen, Stirling, Falkirk High uh, uh, and Haymarket. So a, a lot of focus uh, on that. But again, uh, presiding officer, that is not to take away from what members are saying here, that there should be an encouragement uh, to look at both uh, cycle facilities and storage facilities at stations, 
but also uh, on train cycle storage uh, as well. So my uh, Transport Scotland will continue to encourage and I will continue to encourage ScotRail to work with spokes, work with campaign groups. I do want to reiterate that there will be an increase with the high-speed trains entering service next summer. We have four, bookables, four spaces, two bookable at the moment. There will be eight spaces and they won't be reduced because of the layout and the design of the train. They won't be reduced due to wheelchair provision uh, and that uh, is, is very welcomed indeed. We'll continue to uh, our record investment in active travel uh, over this parliamentary term, which we have committed. I know other members uh, in their interventions pushed us to go further, uh, but certainly we'll continue uh, that record uh, investment uh, where I can. Uh, and uh, as I said, we'll continue to have those conversations with ScotRail. Uh, there will be an increase in those spaces, but in the meantime, until those trains enter service uh, next summer, um, I will continue to urge ScotRail to do what they can with the current stock. I certainly wouldn't want to deny the Ruskell family uh, a successful holiday uh, in Inverness when that comes. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, thank you, Minister. This meeting is suspended until 2 o'clock.